Hello everybody, welcome to Unit 3 Biology Area Study 1. Today we are looking at the relationship between nucleic acids and proteins. It is a big one, so remember it is just a summary um, going over what you kind of need to know, the main dot points of the study design for this area of study. So we'll be looking at DNA and RNA, we'll be looking at the genetic code, um, transcription and translation, we'll be looking at the structure of genes, um, looking at the trip operon, looking at amino acids and how they join together, and looking at proteins, what proteins are, an example of an enzyme, and then looking at the role of the rough ER, the Golgi apparatus, and vesicles in protein export from the cell. So we'll make a start. So in terms of nucleic acids, nucleic acids are basically information molecules that encode instructions. Okay, so the two types of nucleic acids that we look at are DNA, so deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA, ribonucleic acid. And they basically contain all of the information that's going to be required to encode instructions for the synthesis of some kind of protein. Okay, when we look at DNA, okay, we say that it is a code made up of A, T, C, and G. So adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine are our nitrogenous base pairs. Also has a phosphate backbone and it has a sugar. In DNA, that sugar is deoxyribose. So you can see here um, the structure of a nucleotide, okay, made up of a phosphate, a sugar, and the nitrogenous base. In terms of complementary base pairing, A binds with T, okay, and there's a double hydrogen bond there, and C binds with G, and there are three hydrogen bonds there. RNA, there are three types of RNA. We say that RNA is single-stranded. Instead of the sugar being deoxyribose, in this case it is ribose for ribonucleic acid, it also has a phosphate backbone, and in this case the nitrogenous bases are AUCG, so adenine, uracil instead of thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Okay, so in this case, A binds with U and G binds with C. When we talk about RNA, there are three types of RNA that we discuss. Okay, so there is mRNA, which is what's carrying the genetic message to the ribosome. There's rRNA, which is ribosomal RNA, and that makes up the structure of the ribosome. And tRNA, um, which carries the amino acids to the ribosome. So that's involved in translation. And we'll look at that a little bit closely um, soon. Next bit is looking at the genetic code, okay? So that sequence of ATCGs is really, really important because eventually they're going to code for amino acids. So when we look at our DNA double um, helix, okay, it is double-stranded. So it has a three prime end that runs one direction and a five prime end that runs complementary, okay? So three to five and five to three. Um, and that, as you can see here in the 3D sort of version, is how it's sort of structured as well. The main features, though, that you need to know is when we talk about the genetic code, okay, once we have our mRNA sequence, a code basically consists of triplets. So it's read in groups of three, and those triplets are called a codon. So each of these here, UUU, UUC, UUA, UUG, they are all codons, okay, and they're going to code for a particular amino acid. We say that this code is universal. That means no matter if it's an animal, a plant, a fungi, whatever it is, UUU is going to be PHE. Okay, UCU is always going to be SER, serine. So it's universal, no matter what the animal is. We also say that the code is degenerate. What that means is more than one codon can code for an amino acid. So if we look at serine here, UCU, UCC, UCA, and UCG all code for serine. Okay, so that is degenerate. Our DNA template strand always has a start codon. Okay, the start instruction, sorry, is TAC. The codon for that is AUG. And same with stop instructions. DNA is ATT, ATC, ACT. The complementary for the mRNA codon would be UAA, UAG, and UGA. In terms of how this is actually used is when we're looking at protein synthesis. So protein synthesis is basically split into two major sort of stages, we can say. The first stage is called transcription. Transcription occurs in the nucleus of the cell, and that is basically where your DNA 
is being read and a complementary mRNA strand is being created, okay, um, which is complementary to that DNA template strand. Okay, so we call this the pre-mRNA. We then have post-transcriptional modifications that occur. And there's three transcriptional modifications that we talk about. This is also called RNA processing. We have capping at the five prime end, okay, which is just a methyl cap that's added um, to protect the molecule from enzyme attack. We then also add a poly A tail at the three prime end. So it's just a bunch of A's that are added to the end of the three prime end. And we have splicing. Splicing basically removes the introns and keeps them inside the nucleus. And the exons, which are the coding regions, get joined together. Okay. Once these post-transcriptional modifications have occurred, we can call our mRNA mature. Okay. And that mature mRNA is now then going to leave the nucleus and enter the cytoplasm to go towards the ribosome. That's where translation is going to happen. So translation is happening at the ribosome. And that's basically where the anticodon of a tRNA is going to attach to the codon of the mRNA. And this is where this diagram comes in a little bit handy. Okay, so each tRNA molecule is going to have the anticodon, and on the other side, it's going to have the amino acid. So it's going to bring the amino acid to the mRNA and basically drop it off. Okay, those amino acids are then going to join, and we're going to go through what that process is. But you can have a look at these diagrams. They basically summarize what's happening. So transcription is DNA to mRNA. Translation is mRNA to what um, amino acid it's going to be. So if our sequence here is, say, UAC, what we would do is we would look at our chart. We look where UAC is. UAC is here. So the amino acid that that's coding for is tyrosine, T-Y-R. You don't have to memorize this. You will be given this chart. Okay, but you do need to know the start and stop codons. How those amino acids join is called condensation polymerization. Okay, and that is this process here. So each amino acid basically has this structure where we have a carbon in the middle joined with an amine group, so an NH2, and then joined with what we call a carboxyl group, COOH. What's going to happen when we join two amino acids together is we're going to form a peptide bond. And that peptide bond is C-H-O-N. So they're going to join together, that green part, and it's going to release a water. That water is H2O. So this now enables both of those amino acids to have formed a bond, okay? When more and more amino acids form together, we are then forming more and more of those peptide bonds. So we've formed a polypeptide chain, okay, which is going to give rise eventually to a functional protein. So if we look at the structure, hierarchical structure of a protein, we basically say that we've got four sort of hierarchies. Our primary structure is the sequence of amino acids. So that linear sequence, once condensation polymerization has occurred, we've got a sequence of amino acids. This is going to determine the protein function. Okay, so the order of those amino acids is really, really important. The secondary structure is where that linear sequence is going to start to fold in a particular way. Okay, and it folds as either alpha helix, a beta pleated sheet, or random coiling. So if the structure is in this format, it is a secondary structure. How it becomes a tertiary structure is that there's further twisting of those alpha helices and beta sheets, okay, to form a 3D configuration. That 3D configuration is at tertiary, okay? This structure is also very critical for protein function, okay? So if this structure is altered, the protein won't function the way that it's meant to. The big difference between then tertiary and quaternary is that quaternary structure consists of more than one polypeptide chain, okay? So it's two or more polypeptides um, that are all folded together, okay? Whereas tertiary structure is we're still looking at the one long polypeptide folded into that 3D. Beautiful. We will then have our functional protein, okay? And proteins, there's so many different types of proteins. When we talk about the proteome, we basically talk about all of the proteins that are produced in a single cell or an organism, okay? Proteins are diverse. There's so many, so many different kinds. And they all have really different functions, but some of their roles are summarized here. 
So we can have structural proteins that provide some sort of like support and protection. We can have catalytic proteins that are things like enzymes. We can have regulatory proteins, so things like hormones. You may have heard of insulin. We can have immune defense, which we look at in the next um, unit, which will be um, things like antibodies. We have proteins that control movement and transport, so things like hemoglobin, protein channels, things like that. Okay, so you need to know some different examples of proteins that exist. Once those proteins have actually been made, we do sometimes want to export that protein out of the cell. And that export of the protein is called exocytosis. Okay, so exocytosis is that exiting of that protein out of the cell. And there's a few organelles that are involved in this process. So here we have the ribosome, which is where that translation was occurring. We call that the site of protein synthesis. That's where those proteins are being made. What is then going to happen is they're going to travel by the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so it's a network of channels um, that are going to involve the transporting of some of those proteins within the cell. Okay, they're then going to go to the Golgi apparatus, also known as the Golgi complex or the Golgi body. And this is basically going to be where all of the packaging of that protein is going to happen. Okay, so it's responsible for getting that export ready. Vesicles are then going to butt off of that Golgi complex, and that's where the proteins are going to be enclosed in. Okay, so the proteins get enclosed in a vesicle. That vesicle is going to fuse with the plasma membrane, and it's going to secrete that um, protein into the extracellular fluid, into the outside fluid. That's basically a summary of all things protein. If you have any um, comments or questions, leave them in the comments below. We're now going to move on to gene structure. So looking at gene structure, a gene is basically a segment of DNA, okay? And in terms of a gene, it's made up of introns and exons. So introns are your non-coding regions and your exons are your coding regions. Your exons are the part that are going to be translated. We have what we call a promoter at the five prime end, okay? So that's just the location to show you that at the beginning. And then at the three prime end, we have a stop codon, which is going to say that we are no longer transcribing or translating, okay? The example that we look at when we talk about gene regulation is something called the TRP or the trip operon. The trip operon is basically a series of genes that are involved in the production of a particular type of amino acid called tryptophan um, can be used also in protein production. And there's a few main components of a operon that you guys need to know. So the word operon is basically a unit that's made up of lots and lots of um, linked genes that are thought to regulate other genes. Okay, so it's like a regulatory gene. It can regulate other genes. And it's basically made up of these um, parts. So the promoter is the region where RNA polymerase is going to join onto the DNA. The repressor is um, what might bind to stop the progression of things from happening. The operator acts as your on and off switch and the gene itself um, are all located near each other to, to transcribe for something. In this case of um, tryptophan or um, the trip operon, basically if tryptophan levels are high, the gene is transcribed. The repressor protein, if bound to an operator, means that the structural genes will not be transcribed. But if tryptophan levels are low, the regulatory gene is still going to be transcribed but the repressor is not going to be bound to the operator, which means the structural genes will be transcribed. This video here that I've linked is really, really great at explaining this process as well, but this provides you a bit of a summary of the difference between if the repressor is bound to the operator, then the structural genes are not going to be transcribed, and if the repressor is not bound, um, then the structural genes will be transcribed. Okay, so just knowing the difference between those two. The final little bit that we look at here is enzymes okay so enzymes are basically biological catalysts that speed up the rate of a reaction and we're going to look a little bit more into this when we look at respiration and photosynthesis of particular types of enzymes but basically every enzyme has an active site to which the substrate is going to bind to um, and every enzyme has a specific active site okay um, the way that enzymes work is they lower the amount of activation energy required for a reaction to occur. We will be looking at this in a lot more detail in later videos. Otherwise, there's some other videos linked to my channel.
Thanks. Bye.